Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. Changing Higher Ed is sponsored by Blackbaud, the world's leading cloud software company powering social good. With their cloud solution for higher education, Blackbaud connects thousands of campuses worldwide. Visit blackbaud.com slash higher ed to learn how they can help your institution deliver a better experience. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. Our guest today is Dr. Russell Lowry Hart, president of Amarillo College. Dr. Lowry Hart is a product of the area in which the college is located, previously having served as a faculty member and associate provost for academic affairs at nearby West Texas A&M University, before moving to Amarillo as its vice president of academics. He assumed the college presidency in 2014. Dr. Lowry Hart isn't your typical president. He's a game changer. Take, for instance, his tenure at Amarillo. In five years, he's changed the graduation rate from 19% to over 52% through a series of initiatives targeting students. These aren't your typical initiatives. They're designed to meet the student where he or she is at, not what most universities would hope their student is. It's through these type of activities that he was named a 2014 recipient of the National Academic Leader of the Year Award by the National Council of Instructional Administrators. Russell, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Now, you've been the president there at Amarillo College for a few years, but you had started out, and you you told me earlier, you're originally from that area. This is home to me. My wife and I both are from this area. We got our undergraduates here, um, and when we had a chance to come back here, you know, home is a powerful uh, magnet, and We've raised our family here, and and I can't imagine doing this work anywhere else. Well, that's that's fabulous, and I know Amarillo is very, you know, blessed to have you there, especially someone with ties to the community. Now, what brought you back to Amarillo? So I graduated from West Texas A and M as an undergraduate, and I went off and got my PhD, and had a chance to come back as a faculty member in that area, uh, into West Texas A and M. And so I, I was there for 12 years and came back as the speech and debate coach and ended as the associate provost for academic affairs. Uh, but in that process, we did a community study on education attainment in the Amarillo community. And I became clear during that year long study that I was a part of facilitating that this community that I love, that it shaped me was going to be at risk if we couldn't fundamentally change the educational path for the majority of our students. And I realized at that point, the biggest impact on that was going to be the community college in our area, not the university in which I resided. And the vice president for academic affairs position came open and I applied for it with the, with the understanding that Amarillo College was gonna be epicenter of changing the community's economic future and 10 years into this college has only affirmed that for me. Well, you've got both four-year research university Mm -hmm. experience. You've got community college. So you're able to see what students are going through right out of college or even those who don't go to college right out of high school. So you're able to have a good understanding. Was that how you became so passionate about student needs? Um, You know, I I wish I could say it was that innate. I'm a recovering faculty member. I'm an academic at heart. And so I've always looked at these issues from an academic lens. And when I came to AC as as the VP for academic affairs, I looked at our success rates and frankly, I was embarrassed of them. And so I wanted to understand what was happening in the classroom. And I'll admit uh, as an academic that I went into those conversations assuming I already knew what the answers were gonna be for why students were failing so profoundly. 
and they were all academics. They, the, the students needed more tutoring, which they do. They needed more engaged pedagogy and active learning and applied learning, all of which are true. But what my students told me in, in the course of my first year and a half here in focus groups and then surveys is the biggest barrier to their success in the classroom had nothing to do with the classroom. It was childcare, healthcare, transportation, housing, food, utility payments, legal services, because we penalize poverty in this country, and mental health support. Um, that those were the biggest barriers that were keeping them from being successful in the classroom. That understanding from our students changed who I am as a person, not just as a professional, that if we were going to provide students that were going to meet workforce demands and be able to transfer to university, that we're going to change the economic future of our community, I had to build these infrastructures and support services that love students to, to academic success. And that was going to look dramatically different than what I might have thought uh, previous to those conversations. It sounds like it was a light bulb moment for you. Huge light bulb moment. And it all st started with listening to our students, asking them questions and letting them tell us what they need rather than uh, assuming what we, what, what we thought they needed. And what I learned in that process too is that so often higher education is built around a history uh, that doesn't necessarily reflect the students that are currently walking in our communities and on our campuses. And it's committed to perpetuating and privileging the student that used to be, not the student that is, or we're building it for the student that we were, not the student we have. And so what I learned from our students in that whole conversation is that we've got to fall in love in higher ed. We've got to fall in love. It's really intentional using the word love. We've got to fall in love with the students we have, not the students we used to have or the students we wished we had or the students that we were. And that means listening to them, acknowledging them, seeing them, and privileging their voice in shaping our work. Well, if anyone who's a parent should know this, that our kids are not us. No. But I think when we get in the classroom as faculty members, we forget that. We, we do. And I, I just had a senior graduate high school and a junior becoming a senior. I'm well aware that my children aren't me. And the most painful ways that it takes to raise two teenagers as we're doing right now. But we love them anyway, right? I love my kids, even though uh, they frustrate me and they're, um, as they navigate their own life, we have to provide that same uh, familial context for our students if we want them to learn profoundly. And I think that's what I'm most proud of at this college is that we've embraced loving the student we have. We've named her, she's Maria, and she's smart and she's ambitious and she's capable. She just needs us differently than we needed our institutions when we were in school. And it makes perfect sense because the environment in which kids are growing up nowadays is far different than that environment in which we grow up. You know, I'm in my mid 60s at this point. We had the nuclear family. My mom did not work until us kids were in school and then she would go back. But when we got home from school, her job had finished. She was a school teacher. Things have changed dramatically. They have changed. And one of the things that we learned, we had a, a professional development opportunity. We closed the college down and the entire college uh, went through a poverty certification training. And the, the nuclear family is still there in some form or fashion. But there is this concept of generational poverty that has changed how students see the world and how they see themselves and how they see their own advocacy. And most of our institutions of support are set up for ourselves when we have to set ourselves up for a student that's grown up in generational poverty, which is choking our communities across the country and globe. Because generational poverty teaches passivity and it teaches um, that hard work isn't rewarded because all people in generational poverty have lived is incredibly hard work and they haven't seen it pay off. And so it's caused us to rethink 
our bureaucracy, our messaging, our support systems, and really caused caused us to embrace the word love and loving Maria through generational poverty. And the only cure for generational poverty is education. It is. And it's interesting that you chose a female gender to represent your student. What, what, what went into that? Um, it's data driven. Like if you, if you look at who our typical student is, she's 27. Uh, she's an Hispanic female that has, has real financial need. Uh, she's working. This is the typical student at Amarillo College. It's not that different than most students at community colleges and isn't that far off from the university typical student. And she's working two part-time jobs and raising a kid. Uh, but, you know, 60% of my students are females at Amarillo College right now. Uh, you see a real crisis in, in men in higher education across all institution types. So it was important for us to understand our typical student was a female and that she was Hispanic female uh, and that she was 27 years old, not 18. Uh, And we needed to understand that she, we have to design ourselves for her at the same time we have to be cognizant of of pulling um, our, our male students into a successful pathway at the same time. Well, it sounds like it's very different for every institution. Every institution needs to do the kind of research that you did going forward. Let's swap over a little bit. You had put a number of things in place prior to COVID to help your students. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about those, and then let's move into the COVID and how things have changed, if they've changed. I think COVID has changed a lot. Uh, The structures that we had in place, I think, have become more important in COVID. And they're unique structures that a lot of institutions don't have. I've hired four and a half social workers to bring the robust community support that exists in most communities, to bring it into the college and to case manage our students through um, their classes into success uh, with the resources they need to graduate. Uh, we've expanded the number of counselors that we have available because, uh, because so many of our students have grown up in generational poverty. Um, they're also struggling with trauma in ways that I can't understand. Uh, and then we put in robust academic supports with required tutoring and coaching and mentoring. So the systems that we put in place social workers, which are structurally connecting our students to support, require tutoring in our classes to help our students um, improve their learning in the classroom, and then to give them a coach or a mentor that can help connect them to the resources, help them process the bureaucracy, um, and just to give them emotional support, um, and really to lead them to the counseling center. That's the system that's, that is changed our completion rates from 19% five years ago to 52% right now. Wow. Tutoring, counseling, social workers, mental health counseling, those things have been the foundation of our our success story uh, and why Maria has been able to finish what she started in a more profound way. That is fabulous. Now, how did the faculty get involved with this? So our faculty have gone through poverty training. Um, They have an early alert system that, because our faculty on the front lines and are ones that have the most robust relationship with students, they can click in their grade book and say, I've got a Maria in my classroom that needs a, a mental health counselor to reach out to her. So they just click a button and that alert goes to counseling and they'll reach out to that Maria. The same for social work, the same for tutoring. So faculty are kind of what I call the quarterback. They're the ones that are connecting the ball to the player that can uh, score the touchdown. Uh, But they're kind of the one that's gluing the system together as they're teaching the students on the front lines. Does this take special training for the faculty to be able to recognize what a particular issue might be and who is the right person to, to refer that student to? It, it doesn't take much, honestly. Um, 
we, our faculty had gone through poverty training, uh, which was important. But one of the most interesting things that happened in that process is I think our faculty were seeing students not come to class. They were seeing students sleeping in class. They were seeing students not be successful. And our faculty had internalized that, that they had lost their touch, that they weren't being able to engage their students, that they, they were really struggling. And what we learned through poverty training is that we can't assume why the student behavior is what it is. We have to find out. And so... Mm -hmm. We asked and what, what we found affirmed what I'd been hearing from our students that students were sleeping in class because they were working the night shift at the meatpacking plant in our community. They were late to class because the city transportation was so unreliable. Um, and it freed faculty up to understand that they weren't the center of the student disengagement, but they could be the center of supporting students into a more effective a learning environment. And so it just took giving them the resources and a few key pieces of information and they've made magic with it. Well, it, it kind of reminds me of what someone told me years ago. I was doing an accreditation visit with a high school. I used to do those many years ago. And, and the, uh, the principal of the high school was a really special, special man. And he said, kids don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. Yes, I, I, I believe that and I see that. And that's why our college has reimagined itself around the idea of loving our students and, and how personal that is. And until we can remove some of these life barriers, our, we've got to remove those life barriers to free our students up to uh, embrace the learning that's before them. And, and providing those systems of support has fundamentally changed Maria's outcomes. And I'm proud of that. Well, yeah, you've, you've tripled your, your rate yeah. and I'm sure that's still increasing. Now COVID has changed a lot. It's, it's made the needs of these students even more, you know, we, we take for granted having a laptop to be able to do computers, you know, do our schoolwork or, yeah. or a Wi-Fi connection but the students that you're dealing with, a lot of those folks don't have those kind of resources. They don't. And I think that's the danger in the COVID response of moving everything uh, online. And it's why we don't, we, we talk about tech supported learning, not online learning. One, because online uh, creates fear for our students that they don't have the skills or the ability. And tech support, I think, focuses on the learning, not the online piece, although there is that element there, but that learning is so much more than the medium in which it's offered. And tech supported means that we have more counseling sessions available, we have more tutoring sessions available, more advising sessions available uh, as students are migrating through their, their classes in a tech supported environment, but the way those things are accessed are different. And, and that's been the challenge. One of the things that was really important to me as we made this transition like everyone else is that we did have a subset of students that didn't have access to technology at home. So it was really important to me that we keep one of our, our biggest computer lab open and allow our students to access that uh, during this COVID response um, with every safety protocol you can imagine. and. I physically moved my office. I took my family pictures and an external hard drive in my chair, and I moved uh, to the circle desk uh, of that computer lab uh, and started taking students' temperatures when they came in and asking them all the protocol questions and then helping get them connected to a group of employees that would either help them get online or help them get connected to tutoring or advising. and being on the front lines was really important to me personally uh, as a leader of this institution, but it was important to me that we keep those services available to our students or they would drop out or fail out and we would never get them back. And that just isn't an option for us. When we were speaking before you told me about how you were there with your mask on and a number of the students didn't recognize you. Yeah. So um, I have my I have my mask that I, I wear every day. Um, 
And this is what greets our students when they come into the Wear Circle desk, this monstrosity of a human in front of you. And so I ask them how they're doing, I ask them what they need, and I direct them. But but they don't know often that the president of the college is the one that's taking their temperature or giving them a bag of food or uh, sending them uh, to the computer lab. And the joy in that is one, I think I get a better sense of what's happening on the front lines. I think they're freer to tell me what they're struggling with and what their challenges are personally and professionally. But I also think when they do learn that the president of the college has been the one sitting at the circle desk for 10 weeks, I think they have more pride in this college that they fully understand that anyone at this institution will do whatever it can to help our students, including the president. Students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And our students know at Amarillo College that we love them and that we'll do whatever we can to help them. Yeah, that's, that is a fabulous story. So in going forward, what are some of the things that you've learned from the COVID crisis and how are you going to put those into place going forward? I think one of the most important things we've learned is uh, with our counseling center. Uh, We have counselors and we had robust counseling offered to our students before COVID, but about half of the appointments our students would cancel. But moving those appointments online in a Google Meets environment, we've had almost no cancellations. So we're able to counsel with our students more profoundly. Our advisors are having the same experience. And so I think moving forward, uh, a lot of our advising and our counseling will probably stay in an online platform because we're serving more students in this regard. Uh, We're also seeing more need and more trauma. And so we're working um, with Heal the City, which is a free clinic in town, to create a partnership where we can't just counsel our students, but we can connect them to a psychologist that can write them scripts uh, until they can get uh, more robust psychological intervention. Um, Those are things that we haven't really had to do before, but we're seeing the need for that in a more more robust way. Uh, And so I think post-COVID, it's using the robust tools that we've learned how to use in this environment uh, more profoundly to uh, serve more students. And I think our counseling and advising centers are a prime example of what will stay uh, in a remote environment moving forward because our students are accessing more freely and are I think being served more effectively. And that gives me a lot of hope. What you've described to me is something that's very student centric, which is very critical. Now, how is that, how has your academics changed and how do you see that continuing forward? I think students have given us a lot of grace in transitioning to a remote learning environment. I think by the time fall comes around, we we don't get any more grace. We have to be experts at it. And so what I've seen is our, our faculty really embracing professional development opportunities. We're offering and incentivizing robust professional development opportunities for our faculty this summer so that when we come back in the fall, in whatever form that is, we will be ex- extremely effective in whatever modality we offer our learning. Uh, and, and COVID has expediated that. I used to think that it would take us 10 to 15 years for higher education to truly transition most of its learning to a remote environment in some form or fashion, a hybrid environment. And what's happened is that's, that transition has taken place in 10 to 12 weeks. Now we got to get good at it and we've got to determine what classes need to stay in that remote environment and what classes are better in a hybrid or face-to-face environment. Um, But we can make those decisions now based on learning, not on uh, instructor comfort level or student comfort level. We can actually make decisions uh, that privilege learning rather than self. And that's an exciting place to be. and, and, And we can embrace that opportunity. Well, that's fabulous. Just a couple of things before we wrap up. 
if you had three things to tell your fellow presidents, what would you be, what would those top three be? That's a good question. Um, I think the first would be um, to develop the composite of who your student is, not who you think she is. And to make your typical student the centerpiece of your reimagination in a post-COVID world. That happened for us uh, in this post-COVID environment where Maria drives our decision-making. The second thing that I would do is once you get clear on who your typical, typical student is, one of the tools that I use every year is a secret shopper process where I identify a handful of students and I pay them uh, to be a secret shopper for me to go through the processes and help me understand what their experience is. And each year is a different focus. So I've secret shopped our onboarding process. I've secret shopped our tutoring process, our advising process, our learning experiences. Secret shoppers can give you insights that you're not going to get from typical survey data. And the third thing that I've learned more profoundly being in the circle desk of our our WARE student commons is you can look at your data, you can look at your typical student, you can secret shop all you want, but you have got to get your hands dirty and understand what your students are needing on the front lines and what your employees who work on the front lines are needing from you. And I've always been a champion of our frontline employees, but I didn't understand how powerfully important they are and that they have a job description, but what's not in the job description is they fundamentally have to be an expert on every piece of bureaucracy the college offers. So you may be a, an executive assistant in the math department that you have to understand advising, financial aid, tutoring, social services, and, and one of the things that I will do in a post-COVID world is that I will meet with those frontline staff intentionally to learn more from them in the same ways that I've met with our students. Those are three great things. And, and you are only the second person, second president I have heard doing Secret Shopper. And that's, I've been in higher ed 20 years. Well, the Secret Shopper process has been it's fundamentally changed the college. And I'll tell you what came out of our first secret shopper of experiences. Our, our students came back and were really clear that our bureaucracy was getting in the way of serving our students. So I just said, well, tell me what the perfect college looks like for you. And out of that conversation, our students, fund, our, our students wrote our college values based on the college they wanted us to be, not the college we were. And they, as a, as a recovering faculty member, it was scary because they weren't academic words. They didn't have words like global education and critical thinking and problem solving, which I think are the foundational purpose of higher education, not the values of higher education. Um, our values are how we live those purposes, but our values are really about service and relationship. And so um, secret shoppers have, have change the very nature of who we are as an institution. That's fabulous, Russell. Thank you. So what's next for you? What's next for Amarillo? I think what's next for us is to take the learning in this COVID experience from the last 10 weeks and the next 10 and maybe the next 10 weeks after that and figure out how we can become a better institution. So for me, here are things that we're looking at. We're, we're needing to reevaluate our space utilization. And there are jobs that are actually better uh, in a remote working environment where the employees have been more productive. So how do we identify those jobs and employees and how do we support them in a remote work environment long-term in a permanent place? And then how do we reimagine the spaces that we do have to better serve our students? And then, applying that same situation to learning. What learning experiences and classes worked better in a remote learning environment? And, and how do we privilege, the, privilege those? And, and how do we identify what learning didn't work best in a remote learning environment? 
and make sure that those are offered in hybrid and face-to-face. -face. I just think we have a real opportunity to do a lot of data uh, analysis and both on the learning piece and the institutional productivity piece and reimagine ourselves based on this experiment that we've all undergone. Well, that's fabulous. And I just want to note for the listeners, seeing your background on your wall over there, it says AC, Amarillo College Family. Yeah. And that is exactly what you have brought to this college. So thank you so much for all of these great ideas that you've given folks. Any last words for the, uh, for the audience? I'll just say, when you look at that wall that you're looking at, it says AC Family. It also says, wow fun, innovation, and yes. And those are the five words that our students created as the values of the college. That will wow our students, that we'll say yes to them, we'll find solutions that get to yes, we'll be innovative, that we'll create fun as we're also creating family. And that's, that's the wall that our AC students created. So I appreciate you seeing it and helping me acknowledge it. Well, that's my pleasure. Russell, thank you so much. This has been fabulous. My privilege. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for listening. And a special thank you to this week's special guest, Dr. Russell Lowry Hart, president of Amarillo College, and for his sharing with us how to create an environment that enables underrepresented students to overcome barriers to their success. I also want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, Blackbaud. Visit blackbaud.com slash higher ed to learn about their cloud fundraising, accounting, education management, scholarship, and analytics solutions that are powering some of higher ed's top institutions. Our next guest is Dr. Gordon Gee, president of West Virginia University. Gordon came back to talk with us about governance and how critical it is to have a great relationship between the president and the board chair and the other things that make a difference in governance, especially during crises such as COVID. You won't want to miss this one, folks. This episode of Changing Higher Ed was brought to you by Blackboard, the world's leading cloud software company powering social good. Be sure to visit blackbaud.com slash higher ed to learn how they can help your institution deliver a better experience from admissions to advancement. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. We would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post production by David L. White.